I think like if you lose your job and you have all this expertise, I think that's a great time to become a coach. Um, if you're not happy in what you're doing and you're good at something, I mean, anyone could be a coach at anything. Like if you were an athlete, you could be a coach. If you're a hairdresser, you could coach other people. There's so much coaching that needs to be done, not just in, you know, our typical, you know, career or leadership coaching or executive coaching, but in various facets of your life. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the People Hum interview series. I'm Ashwarya Jain from the People Hum team. People Hum is an end-to-end, one-view integrated human capital management automation platform, the winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that's specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and channel that receives more than 400,000 visitors a year and we also publish several interviews with well-known names globally every month. And today we have a very special guest, we've got Gail Miller with us. Gail is the CEO of Consult Networks and a staffing unconscious bias, diversity and corporate culture strategist. She's a career and business coach, speaker and author and currently living her passion by transforming candidates to become the best version of themselves in order to have happy career, happy lives and help companies hire the best talent for company growth. She has won several awards such as CEO of the Year 2017 Networking Karma Business Book Top Business 2014 to 2017 Diversity Business, NJ Biz Best 50 Women in Business, Top 25 Leading NJ Women Entrepreneur Finalist, and is an Enterprising Women of Year Finalist. We are so thrilled to have you, uh, Gail. Welcome to the show, and thank you so much for taking our time for us. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that introduction. I've never had an introduction like that before. <laughs> Yeah, you sure do have a lot of accolades under your belt. Um, you know, I'd love to know about the work that you're, you know, concentrating on right now, and how did you develop, you know, interest um, in in unconscious bias. So right now, I am focused mainly. Well, there's two parts of my business. I have Consult Networks, which is the diversity unconscious bias, inclusion, and recruiting strategic part of my business. So I help companies in those areas from a strategy perspective. Um, But a huge part is definitely the unconscious bias part and how it impacts recruiting, corporate culture, sales, you know, the entire organization. So that's one part. Um, And then the other part is my other organization, which is Career Networks, which is more of like the career coaching, and the business coaching, more from like an entrepreneurial perspective. So um, I am doing both of those, so I'm really busy. (laughs) Um, But it's a natural progression from my background, which is um, staffing and recruiting on both the corporate and the agency side. And all those years of over 25 years of experience I was seeing patterns of unconscious bias and unfair hiring practices. And that's when I really started to say to myself, I really need to focus on this unconscious bias, even before it was like becoming like a thing, because um, it's really hindering the right people getting hired, the right candidates getting hired. And it impacts organizations when it comes to their innovation um, and diversity and inclusion. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Sounds really interesting. And, you know, I, I'm really sort of intrigued by unconscious bias, right? So I know that you uh, do mention in your TED Talk that it just takes six seconds for a recruiter to, you know, just go through your resume and there's just so much decisioning that's going on in somebody's head and they are not even aware of that. But, you know, how do you really tackle it? How should I be mindful as a recruiter or as a hiring manager of my unconscious bias and work towards eliminating that? Well, let me first say this. You need to understand what a conscious bias is first to combat it. So, it's, it's part of our brain. So we are bombarded with 
11 million pieces of information at any given time. And that's a lot. However, we can only handle 10 to 40. So our brain has shortcuts and we need that in order to have an easier life. Like, cause if you didn't, it would be cumbersome to even go to the grocery store to walk across the street. You would have to sift through all that information. So you have that filing cabinet in your brain. But what happens is it also could work against you at times, not all the time, because we need this, is all your experiences and all your stereotypes come into play unconsciously when you make certain decisions. And that's how unconscious bias happens. So what can you do? Number one, I want to say everyone has unconscious bias. It's inevitable. If anyone tells you that I don't have it, they don't know what they're talking about. Even me who studies it, I have it. But what could you do? You could be more self-aware. And self-awareness takes a lot of work. It's slowing down and questioning your decisions that you make every day and really being honest with yourself. And when you start doing that, then slowly but surely, um, you become more aware and you could start making better decisions. Because I think when it comes to unconscious bias, what is it about? It's really about making right judgments, better decisions, and focusing on what matters. And if you see my TEDx talk, you notice that I say, so what? Because a lot of the things that we say in corporate America, we think that matter, really don't. So I have that so what test. But in organizations, you can't rely on individuals to be responsible for their own unconscious bias to eradicate it in an organization. Yes, that's the first step. I think everyone should take a look at their own unconscious bias, but an organization must have policies and procedures in place to help eradicate it. Is it foolproof? No, but those are the things that it's gotta be baked in the system, but you have to make sure that your policies and procedures in and of itself are not biased. And that's why diversity is so important. You know, a lot of people are like, why do we need, you know, what's the big deal with diversity? Well, if I tell you that it'll impact your innovation, it'll impact your bottom line, it'll impact how you interact with your uh, clients or customers, that's huge because if you have a workforce that thinks the same. And when I talk about diversity, I'm not just talking about race and gender. I'm talking about diversity of thought um, and all the other diversities that you could think of, right? There, there's so much diversity. It's not just, you know, age. I mean, that's huge too. And it's important to have this diversity um, in your organization because you have to think about your clients. And if you want to provide the best service, you need that diversity. So that person will think, well, you know, you're a bunch of 30 year olds, but did you ever think of this? And maybe they wouldn't have thought about that because they're not 55, right? So it's about experience. It's about um, having an employee, employee population that's not only diverse, but has equal opportunity. It's about equality and being fair. Yeah. So you could have a diverse employee population too, but then who's getting promoted? You know, it's still, I see this a lot with my clients. They think they're doing a great job with diversity and they think it's just about check boxes and it's not. And it, they, you know, they cherry pick. It's not about that. Um, but once they have, you know, diverse, they're doing well, you know, they're, they're doing their best, but then who are they promoting? It's still, you know, white men, you know, not to pick against white men. I'm not a bashing anyone, but that's what's continuing to perpetuate is, is white men at the top. So, um, once I get to that middle management, it's like, there's a plateau and then there's nothing going up. So it's providing those opportunities to, um, everyone and, um, giving everyone a fair shake. And it's hard. It's hard when you have all these unconscious biases and we have it 
from the minute we get out of the womb, like even the messaging that, that we're told from media and, you know, every facet of life, there is unconscious bias and think how it impacts everyone like healthcare, you know, doctors have it, teachers have it, um, judicial system or media, um, you know, how they report the news. I mean, it's great. The last couple of years and how they report the news in the U.S., because I know this is global, it's been very worrisome to me, you know, uh, the kind of information that we're getting, the bias or, you know, information that people believe and hold on to. Um, and then you tend on to, you tend to believe the information that you believe, right? That's, that's the type of bias that you read something and, you know, half the country will say that's wrong and half the country will say, oh, I agree with that. Well, why is that? It's because you want to believe that because that's your belief. So you're confirming it. It's confirmation bias. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I think I think, Gail, that a lot of people do not even realize that they make so many decisions because of, you know, certain uh, kind of biases and to be aware enough uh, to, you know, actually know that I have to be more self-aware in itself is, you know, something, right? And as you said, it's, it's about understanding what impact it has on your business, on your culture, on just, um, you know, your very ecosystem, which is, you know, full of people, it's a breathing ecosystem. Uh, and diversity is what brings in so much innovation, uh, you know, it, it brings in color, right? And I think that is that's so important, as you said. But I'm also interested in understanding that unconscious bias, um, is it something that, you know, technology can help with in any way? What are your thoughts on that? So technology, um, there's artificial intelligence that's being created for unconscious bias. And um, what's the other one? Um, virtual reality. Because a big part of unconscious bias is understanding a situation that you you can't be a part of. So I'll give you an example for virtual reality, which I find fascinating. They created um, virtual reality for healthcare workers that um, oversee Alzheimer's patients. And they use this virtual reality to understand what these patients are going through day in and day out. And it was eye-opening for them when they did this to understand like, oh, wow, this is what it feels like. And what happens is you have more empathy. And this is a big part of it. You know, as a white woman, I have no idea what it's like to be a black woman, right? I can't say I understand how you feel because I don't, I'm not in their shoes, right? And someone else can say they're not in my shoes, right? They haven't, they're not, they haven't led my life. They don't, and that's okay, but we need to have empathy and understand what other people are going through to help not be biased, right? You don't have to walk in that person's shoes, but it's good to have empathy towards them. So when you have empathy, then you're thinking about that particular person or their situation um, is more evolved. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but I do want to say about the artificial intelligence, we got to be really careful because studies have shown that what you put in is what you get out. So even the art of they're finding, even with the artificial intelligence, there's bias within the artificial intelligence. Yeah. yeah that's so. I, I question that even, even technology. I mean, technology is a big factor as far as like resumes and taking off identifiers, because that's a huge part. Um, the voice, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, people think, oh, the phone interview, there's no bias. Oh, yes, there is, there is, because of your voice, your tone, your pitch. Um, there, there could be bias against anything. So um, yeah. Artificial intelligence is the thing right now, but I would say I'm very cautious, very cautious with yeah. that as well. Yeah. 
that was actually sort of my follow up question that you know suddenly now we're all virtual right and you know we had to take video calls to interview people so you could not really tell someone you know what they're wearing you know what shoes they're wearing and uh, you know that sort of unconscious bias might be eliminated but what are you know other aspects that you saw during that period as you know biases coming across even even through a video call so i'm i'm going to use my so what you just said well we can't see what they're wearing we can't see their shoes and i'm going to say that's a big so what who cares how does that impact how they're doing the job now someone is going to say because of how we've been wired it does matter and you could talk yourself into it and i'm going to tell you it doesn't matter i'm going to tell you that if someone's wearing ripped shoes and they're going to make your company a billion dollars you're going to tell me you're not going to hire them you know so um as far as video it's the same thing look you're looking at my background i'm looking at your background right now i'm already si- in in a couple of seconds you've sized me up i've sized you up based upon the surroundings i may have a book let's see if i had a book you would notice the title maybe you wouldn't like it maybe you don't like the pictures that are behind me maybe i have pictures of my family maybe i um i don't know that there could be so, a religion something pertaining to religion behind me and you would say to yourself oh, it doesn't matter but unconsciously maybe it would so it's no different with video absolutely no it's all the same it's all the same no. i don't like your flowers in the background that's turning me off no it's not but i'm just saying someone could say that and say and just be like what be distracted by that like what is that right so it sounds stu- it sounds ridiculous and sometimes you have to point out the ridiculous but this is what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah that is quite interesting you know you probably don't even realize it even through a video call it's just it's a lot of information you're taking in um, it is yeah so i i want to shift gears a little bit and you know since you also hold expertise in talent retention among other things um in these times right you know what do you think leaders can do to be a little bit more sensitive you know we we did kind of touch upon empathy are there some other aspects that would help them retain employees better okay so this is covid is a horrible thing um but one thing that it taught us is that there could be flexibility in the workplace. And with all my years of recruiting experience, one of the most frustrating things for me was having companies say, "I cannot hire this person no matter how good they are if they want to work from home one day a week or if they want to leave early because they need to pick up their child." Because they didn't think that they can get it, the work done. If I have to do it for this employee, I have to do it for someone else. So what does that tell me? It tells me that employers don't trust their workforce to get the job done. And I think that COVID has brought out the thought of being flexible um with employees. and realizing that employees can be productive and they're not going to let you down on the most part. Um and even working from home with kids that are going to school. I mean this has been so challenging on so many different levels because we're talking about people's health, okay? And that's the most important. Your health is your wealth. I will tell you that for sure. Someone who is a cancer survivor, health is your wealth. That's first. So you're dealing with a health issue and companies number 1 have to um make sure that they're sensitive to their employees health number 2 is the commingling of and now we're seeing it more now obviously the commingling of how work and our personal lives can impact each other right because now you're sitting at home you've got you could have a crying baby in the background and now the employer sees this so 
employers need to be flexible. They have to have empathy um, and they have to have some latitude. And hopefully this experience will change the landscape forever. And I think it will. I think employees, this will open up their minds now. Um, and a lot of the companies are now going to be totally remote. And now it's showing that they're trusting their employees, that they can get the job done, even during a pandemic, right? Something unprecedented. People are getting their job done under such unusual and stressful circumstances. So I hope this has taught companies to trust your employees and provide support and listen to them because th this is very important that each employee they're not all cookie cutter, right? What's important to one employee may not be important to another and vice versa. So it's really being personalized with each employee and knowing what um, they value, what's important to them, what their challenges are and, and follow that. And I think that's really, really important. And if you do that, then you'll retain your employees. If you respect them and you listen to them, and you treat them as an individual, that's gold. Yeah, completely agree with you, Gail. I think it's true that, you know, the pandemic has taught us to trust each other better, to just empathize with each other better. And I do see that, you know, uh, in organizations now that, that slight change is coming in where you don't have to be on a Zoom call, you know, 12 hours a day to show that, you're working to your employer because that's ridiculous. <laughs> right. It's true. But people are getting Zoom burnout too. Yeah. Another complaint I'm hearing a lot is lack of communication from managers during this time. Because they're going through stuff too, right? But it's it's important to touch in with your employees no matter what that's and make sure they're doing okay. Um, you can't just fall off the face of the earth. Unless, you know, God forbid you're going through something and there's health issues there. But um, I'm finding that, that that's a big complaint I'm hearing is that employees feel that uh, the managers are just kind of checking out. Mm -hmm. But again, you never know what's going on in someone's life. You don't know what their challenges are. So yeah. we've got to be mindful of that. True. So just doing more frequent one-on-ones, you know, you're saying that that mm -hmm. Yep. Have a virtual drink, <laughs> a virtual lunch, you know, the little things, it's the little things that people like that really mean a lot. You don't have to do anything grand. You know, people think you've got to do something grand. It's just, people just want to know that they're being heard um, and that their employer cares. It's just the gesture that matters, the thought that, you know, they put into it that ultimately matters to most employees. That's true. Yeah, that's, that's really nice to understand. And, you know, you've also held an impressive as well as a very diverse record in terms of coaching. So what I want to ask you and what I'm sure our audience is intrigued to know too is, you know, what's a good time for anybody to consider uh, professional coaching, much like, you know, you decided to move on from, uh, you know, sort of an, a corporate life and move on to professional coaching, what would you suggest to someone who's looking to be, you know, sort of in the same footsteps as you? So I, I'm a firm believer anytime is a good time. <laughs> like, just go for it if you want it. I mean, it's, I think, like, if you lose your job and you have all this expertise, I think that's a great time to become a coach. Um, if you're not happy in what you're doing and you're good at something, I mean, anyone could be a coach at anything. Like if you're an athlete, you could be a coach. If you're a hairdresser, you could coach other people. There's so much coaching that needs to be done, not just in, you know, our typical, you know, career or leadership coaching or executive coaching, but in various facets of your life. So I would say, um, pick the thing that you're either really good at or passionate about. And I say, go for it and learn as much as you can. I think what's really important to be a great coach is patience and, a, and great listening skills. True. That is true. Uh, and you are a great listener. So I love that about you. Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, uh, I could go on and on about recruiting and you know uh, candidate sourcing. What are things that leaders um, you know should what what should they do to remove unconscious bias? But you know, I'm going to ask you the last question to wrap this up for you know lack of time. Is um, do you have any quote that really describes your feelings or any sound bites that describes your feelings the best way about you know the whole situation right now what do you think is the future of work or anything that you stand by i'm going to stick with the quote that i had a poster in my wall as a kid that was in my yearbook that i put in my yearbook which obviously is a long time ago, <laughs> which is high school. And that is from Oliver Wendell Holmes. And the quote goes like this, and it's, it served me well. Um, I find the great thing in this world is not so much where we stand as in what direction we are moving. To reach the port of heaven, we must sail sometimes with the wind and sometimes against it, but we must sail and not drift nor lie at anchor. And that's my quote. <laughs> That is really deep. <laughs> I'm a deep thinker. <laughs> that's why I'm studying. That's why I studied unconscious bias. That's why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah I, I, I actually made in college. I majored in sociology and philosophy. So that's got to tell you something. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that loves, you know, philosophy. Well, um, I had super fun, Gail, uh, you know, just having this conversation it was really an honor having you today. Oh, thank you. Actually, it was an honor for me to talk to you today. So thank you. Well, take care, Gail, and uh, hope to stay in touch with you. Same here. All right, take care.